The now infamous Dominic Cummings Newsnight introduction got way more attention than in truth it ever deserved. It was neither the best nor the worst opening we've ever done. I say we because the scripts were as always written, modified, rewritten, edited, signed off by a team. The original story, you'll remember, had been broken by Pippa Creera, her excellent colleagues at The Mirror, who then went on to report many more stories of rule breaking over the subsequent 12 months. We merely picked up the story the day after the Cummings Rose Garden press conference. And our intro stated bluntly and baldly that he'd broken the rules. And it asked why the government, Boris Johnson, was standing by him. The introduction set out, as is often the case, the rest of the show. We had Conservative MPs explaining the PM's loyalty. We had pollsters explaining the public horror on that issue. We had defenders, we had critics, and we had a detailed analysis of which rules had been broken and when. In other words, the introduction was a precy of what viewers could expect of the whole show. And on the night itself, the programme passed off with a few pleasant texts from BBC editors and, frankly, little else. It was only the next morning that the wheels fell off. A phone call of complaint was made from Downing Street to the BBC News management. This, for context, is not unusual. It wasn't unusual in the Blair days, far from it, in the Brown days, in the Cameron days. What I'm saying is, it is pretty normal for government spin doctors to vocalise their displeasure with journalists. What was not foreseen was the speed with which the BBC sought to pacify the complainant. Within hours, a very public apology was made. The programme was accused of a failure of impartiality. The recording disappeared from the iPlayer and there were paparazzi outside my front door. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing here trying to pretend our intro was the Gettysburg Address. When I hear it now, honestly, I think it was a bit long-winded, wordy, sounded a bit peaked. But I don't think, wow, what a shocking breach of impartiality because we called out the actions of one of the chief architects of the COVID laws. We show our impartiality when we report without fear or favour, when we're not scared to hold power to account, even when it feels uncomfortable to do so, when we understand that if we've covered rule breaking by a Scottish chief medical officer or an English government scientist, then journalistic rigour should be applied to those who make policy within number 10. The one person, ironically, who understood this was Dominic Cummings himself who texted me that very evening to offer his wry support. So back to the speed of response. <laughs> Weird, right? <laughs> Why had the BBC immediately and publicly sought to confirm the government spokesman's opinion without any kind of due process? It makes no sense for an organisation that is admirably, famously rigorous about procedure unless it was perhaps sending a message of reassurance directly to the government itself. Put this in the context of the BBC board, where another active agent of the Conservative Party, a former Downing Street spin doctor and former advisor to BBC rival GB News now sits, acting as the arbiter of BBC impartiality. According to the Financial Times, he's attempted to block the appointment of journalists he considers damaging to government relations, provoking Labour's deputy leader, among others, to call it Tory cronyism at the heart of the BBC. The UK correspondent of the German public broadcaster, ARD, Annette Dittert, goes a step further. She writes, public service broadcasters must always act as the corrective should always hold governments accountable, must never end up becoming the megaphone. That's the whole point of publicly owned broadcasters in a liberal democracy. We're becoming anaesthetised to the rising temperature in which facts get lost, constitutional norms trashed, claims frequently unchallenged. This surreal summer 
has been a prime example. A total disconnect between the dire warnings over energy and food bills that are massively hurting people in this country and the SW1 power vacuum circus. We followed Tory leaders on tour, assessing their views on the culture war, the price of their accessories or a tax cut. We've heard not once, but twice from the front runner that a policy idea was misinterpreted by the media and that, my favourite, a question was asked in a left-wing way. <laughs> We then saw that same candidate caught privately apologising to the presenter for attacking the media as if it had been an indelicate comment she'd made about his tie rather than a staple of our democracy. And we only know that conversation because it was caught on hot mic. That conversation should have been said out loud. This isn't normal, or rather, it shouldn't be. Things that for many decades were givens, the checks and balances on the executive, the role of the judiciary or the civil service or the electoral commission, a media free from interference or vilification now appear vulnerable. We're seeing politicians move in directions that are deeply and clearly deleterious to basic democratic government. So what has changed? Well, there's always been scope for abuse in our constitution, of course, but in recent times, so many previously settled questions around our democratic norms have been upended and at a staggering speed. Dr. Hannah White of the Institute of Government observes, this is not about introducing change per se, which we've always seen. It's about people in power who are prepared to test the very limits of the constitution to achieve their aims. You don't have to look far for examples. Things that once would have shocked us now seem commonplace. The ministerial code violated with impunity, a blatant disregard for the principles of the cabinet manual, the unlawful attempt to prorogue parliament for five weeks by an executive that wanted to remove parliamentary democracy from the decision-making process. The blink and you miss it moment, the governing party's Twitter account changed its name to Fact Check UK in the middle of an election campaign to cope party propaganda in a format that sounded objective. Or the admission by the then Northern Ireland Secretary that he'd be prepared to break international law, but only in a very specific and limited way. <laughs> like murder. I'm not sure the breaking of international law gets off the hook for being limited and specific. We can go on. Limits placed on judicial review, ministers' failure to defend the role of the judiciary, efforts to increase political control over public appointments, the attempts made to change parliamentary conduct rules for cronies. You know all this. You can join in the chorus. On the other side of the world, the former Australian PM, Scott Morrison, was discovered to have awarded himself the powers of five additional ministerial authorities. This autocratic indulgence signed off by the Governor-General, kept secret from Cabinet colleagues, from his Parliament and from the Australian people. Not so secretly, Donald Trump unilaterally declared himself the winner of an election he lost. <laughs> this is just the context. Dr White believes the key dynamic here has been about privileging alternative sources of authority, the will of the people in the referendum, Johnson's personal mandate to try and stay in power, the shutting out of ethics advisers or the Lord's Appointment Commission when taking decisions. I'm going to take you this time to early 2016. The UK is beginning to debate the big questions around Britain's potential exit from the EU. It's complicated stuff. We're trying to offer our viewers both sides of a fiendishly difficult debate and that intention was right. But we still got it wrong. We fell into what we might call the Patrick Minford paradigm. In other words, it might take our producers five minutes to find 60 economists who feared Brexit and five hours to find a sole economic voice who espoused it. But by the time we went on air, we simply had one of each. We presented this unequal effort to our audience as if it was balance. It wasn't. I'd later learn that the ungainly name for this myopic style of journalism was both sidism, which talks to the way it reaches a, a superficial balance whilst obscuring a deeper truth. 18 months 
after an attempted coup on the Capitol, on the democratic functioning of America, the architect behind the lie that brought the rioters is considering another run for president with the backing of millions of Americans. Here in the UK, we spent early summer watching the havoc at Dover Customs meet with a wall of silence around Brexit. Those who promised to get Brexit done can't mention it because it clearly isn't. Their insistence on third nation status has meant passport checks and horrendous waiting times. Labour avoids talking about Brexit because it's decided, rightly or wrongly, to distance itself from Remainer tags. And large sections of both the BBC and government supporting newspapers appear to go into an automatic crouch position whenever the Brexit issue looms large. Many broadcasters fear discussing the obvious economic cause of major change in this country in case they get labelled pessimistic, anti-populist, or worse still, see above, unpatriotic. And there's the rub. Because whatever our journalism does, it must earn the trust of our listeners, our audiences, our readers. Otherwise, we are mouthpieces. We are mere clients of those in authority, cosy with those in command, disconnected from the very people that we are trying to serve. 